I want to welcome everybody to today's workshop with August Ball of Cream City Conservation and Consulting. Today's topic is social identities and intersectionality. And um, there was no pre-reading for today's workshop. This, this meet workshop will be recorded and shared on our website for one month afterwards for those who would like to review it or who weren't able to join us today. I'm Laura Riley. I'm the coordinator of Chicago Wilderness. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank the U.S. Forest Service and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources Urban and Community Forestry Program. Funding for, from them supports the assessment workshops and the training that we have been doing with August Ball and Cream City. And uh, we're really excited to be able to bring this series to you today. To find out more about Cream City, I'm going to drop some information in the chat. And with that, August, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? I'm having some audio concerns today. Yes, okay, great. All right then, let's get our screen up here. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining me today. Again, my name is August Ball, and I am the founder and CEO of Cream City Conservation. So in today's topic, uh, we're going to be discussing components of identity, your identity, the identity of your colleagues. Uh, we're also going to explore some concepts around our socialization specifically as it relates to time, as it relates to perceptions of professionalism, perceptions of correctness. Um, and so in order to do that, I want to ground us in some group agreements. So uh, I'm going to read off those group agreements. And if you can adhere to those today, please do type into the chat, I agree. If you have any concerns or hesitations about these group agreements, please um, raise your hand so that we can dialogue on where we may have lost you. So the first group agreement I'm going to ask us to um, uphold today is to listen to understand. The next is to speak your truth and be open to the truths of others. The next is to sit in discomfort, knowing that if this work were easy, we would have done it already. <laughs> um, and that this work is also constantly unfolding and it involves and requires that we build muscles. The next is to recognize that intent is different from impact. Our intent can be great, but that does not absolve us from the impact of our actions and our words, and sometimes even our lack of action and words. Confidentiality. Now we are a large group, of course, but it is important that we begin building a community of learning and trust, which means that what is learned here leaves and what is said here stays. Uh, we want to be mindful when we are telling stories that don't necessarily belong to us, uh, because we might uh, mistakenly misrepresent the story. We might share a story that was is not meant to be shared with others. So just bear in mind that we want to share what is learned, but we keep what is said. The next is to expect and accept non-closure. So this means that we accept that things are not always going to unfold and conclude in neat, nice packages. This also means that um, many of the conversations we're going to begin having today are conversations that are going to unfold over a lifetime, um, especially when you're having these conversations with colleagues, with friends and family. So be mindful to um, uh, not get too caught up with having an expectation of how things will conclude. The next is to participate to the fullest extent of your ability. This is very much so a challenge by personal choice experience. Um, and we get what we put into these sorts of learning environments. Uh, the next is to share gratitude for feedback. 
What I mean by this is that it is very challenging to offer a colleague, um, a stranger feedback on um, how their allyship, how their co-conspiratorship could be more impactful, or even feedback on uh, perhaps a mindset or a perspective that might be um, under-informed. So please do see that as a gift whenever possible. Um, especially when the delivery might not be to your preference. Just know that we many of us don't have a lot of practice in calling one another in. And so uh, I invite you all, whether it's in this space or in any other space, um, to not have your priority be on how feedback is delivered. While that is important, um, try to to engage in some cultural humility and know that the person giving you the feedback is having a hard time in and of themselves, right, in terms of giving you that feedback. So please see it as a gift. Express gratitude for that, even if it's hard to hear, uh, because that's that's how we grow, right, is getting feedback from others. Doesn't mean you have to agree with all of the feedback, but consider all the identities that you're bringing into a space when someone is giving feedback, consider what you might be pushing against uh, when someone gives you feedback that might not align with your existing uh, uh, perspective. And then lastly, please be present. Um, we understand that these workshops are long, they're two and a half hours, uh, but please avoid, uh, if whatever possible, multitasking, checking emails, um, having side conversations, uh, because I don't want you to miss any of the information uh, that we'll be covering uh, in any of these sessions, okay? Um, yeah, my father used to say, uh, uh, when you spread yourself thin and you do a lot of things, like multitasking is just doing a lot of things poorly. <laughs> so I invite you to, to consider being present as much as you possibly can today. And with that, if you can agree to these group agreements, please type into the chat, I agree. If you have concerns with any of these group agreements, uh, please do raise your hand so that we can dialogue. Let's see that's coming in. All right. So here are our objectives for today. We're going to define intersectionality. We're going to examine uh, social class theory and the implications of classism in the workplace. I'm going to introduce a concept uh, known as chronomics, and we're going to explore two binary um, comparisons of time and relationship to time, which is polychronic and monochronic. I'm going to introduce um, context cultures, both high and low context. And we're going to continue uh, developing shared language and understanding, specifically around what it will take to cultivate equitable and inclusive workplace environments. So to start, uh, intersectionality is the inter is a term that defines the interwovenness of various aspects of our humanity. This can include concepts such as race, class, sexual orientation, ability, gender, etc. It informs how the human experience is compounded um, by identity uh, as the individual exists throughout society. Intersectionality was a term coined by attorney Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. She encourages us to consider that intersectionality is a lens through which we can see where power and um, uh, identity collides. And she expresses that this is also the acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and privilege. So, I like to use this tool called the powerhouse, which helps to illustrate um, on a more macro level how our identities offer us experiences of uh, privilege and experiences of oppression, and how it is very much so possible to have the inter to have the intersectional experience um, of both privilege and oppression within one body. So, if I were to ask you all, uh, what is the dominant racial group? What would you say? 
And you can unmute or you can put it into the chat. White. Thank you. Yeah. White. So we know. Thank you. So we know from uh, from our very first session on racial equity and environmentalism that uh, colonialism has had a deep global impact around colorism um, and consequently race, right? Which we know is not real. It's a social construct. We made it up. However, racism is very much so real, right? And so across the globe, not just in the United States, the concept of whiteness um, holds significant social power. What about gender? What is the dominant gender group? Male. Male. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. What about sexual orientation? What is the dominant sexual orientation? Heterosexual. Cis. Yeah. And ability. Who's our world typically built for? Able bodied. Yeah. And so then we start to think about class and wealth and education. I use the term owning class because wealthy or rich is very subjective, but this concept of owning things is very much so a dominant concept across the globe. Uh, in education, we tend to value formal education, right? That's been affirmed and accredited by a particular institution that holds power. And we tend to devalue other forms of education. Um, with age, while older individuals, right, tend to hold power uh, when it comes to who we value, youth is typically something that is uh, considered to hold more value than not. We can see this through the media, through general um, uh, uh, pressure, right, to, to maintain a quote unquote youthful appearance. We tend to be um, very dismissive of our elders. Now I will say, however, Ageism also functions on the other spectrum where we tend to be dismissive of children, right? And dismissive of young people also. So there's, there's some wide range of thoughts around age, but um, for national origin, right? That blue passport holds a lot of global power. <laughs> um, and I can tell you as a world traveler, um, the ease in which individuals with a, an Amer a United States passport uh, can, can, can um, uh, transverse across uh, borders is, is quite interesting in comparison to uh, mm -hmm. other um, uh, uh, national origins. What about religion? What is our dominant religion? Christian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how do we know this? Like in places like America, how do we know that the Christian faith is the dominant faith? Get the holidays off. Mm -hmm. Even though we don't have a state religion, right? It is uh, the Christian faith is the one uh, religious sect that tends to be recognized by government, right? Um, whereas if you, uh, we, you know, we've just um, completed the celebration or we're in the middle of the celebration of Passover. Um, and I believe, uh, you know, Huli has also recently passed. Uh, so these are concepts that we have to think about when we're building out our workplace practices uh, in terms of who are we unduly benefiting or burdening with, with our existing um, norms and practices. Okay, so again, this is not at all an exhaustive list, right? Uh, but I hope that this helps illustrate the building blocks of privilege and oppression within society. And so um, if we are not... Um, actively dismantling the powerhouse, then everything we do is in support of it, right? Take a moment to consider how many building blocks in the dominant identity group can you pinpoint for yourself? You don't have to share, you don't want, but just take a moment to consider how many times do parts of your identity show up in the dominant category? And now take a moment to consider how many times do parts of your identity show up in the marginalized category? Now, keep in mind, these are components to our identity that we did not choose, right? Even though age and education are fluid, um, even education is dependent on access, right? It's dependent on what resources we have available to us. 
yes, we can change our religion per se, but our mindsets and our perspectives around the world are very much so formed through our family of origin. Um, and that tends to determine which direction, which perception, uh, which mindsets we tend to uh, take on. And it is very unlikely, um, very uncommon, I should say, uh, that, that we have a different um, uh, uh, spiritual and religious background, you know, than our family of origin. It absolutely does happen, uh, but we tend to not veer too far from our, from our family of origin with regards to these components. So uh, it's important to be mindful that while we did not choose these building blocks, right, we cannot absolve ourselves uh, from, from the privileges and the, uh, the uh, oppressive nature that society has built around these identity forms. Um, but we can work in collective to, to interrupt uh, the meaning that is assigned to these identities. Not that we end up becoming this melting pot of, of, of homo homogeneity, but rather where these components no longer determine who gets to thrive in our society. So again, the powerhouse not only sustains systems of power and inequity, but it also sustains perceptions and biases. So when you think about your own identity, what social demographic first comes to mind when you think about yourself? And feel free to put that into the chat. Now, noting, of course, this is not the only identity that comes to mind, but think of the most primary identity when you wake up in the morning, you're brushing your teeth. What part of your identity is most salient for you? Mm -hmm. Oh, I see wage slave, <laughs> mother, um, Filipina American, queer, black, biracial, white suburban, yeah, middle-aged white woman, no children. Yeah, great, property owner, mother, yeah. I know for myself as somebody who experiences chronic pain, um, ability is really salient for me some mornings. <laughs> some mornings I wake up feeling really healthy and some mornings I wake up not so much. <laughs> um, and these are also things that kind of shift and, and, and um, contort over time. For, you know, for those of you who are parents, right, maybe 20 years ago, that was not the most salient part of your identity. And maybe today, as a parent, right, that identity is really salient, whether you're, the first thing you think of, think of when you wake up in the morning is, oh, I got to feed the kids, get them off to school. Um, or it might be a pet owner or, right, homeowner, I got to go, you know, shovel the snow. So, all right. Now think about how do these identities influence your life? Okay. So again, as I, and feel free to type that into the chat as well. Mm -hmm. Older female feeling, mm -hmm. eats up the majority of my life, causes limitations based on my identities. Paying more taxes for items like the pink tax. Pri privilege, ah, sorry, privilege is not having, oh, I lost it. <laughs> Where did that go? Privilege is not, uh, not to have to actively consider and navigate the identity uh, of white male relative to other, other dominant identities. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Thank you so much, friends. Keep those coming. Yeah, family separation, acculturation, immigrant identity, yes. Double-edged, my physical limitations stop certain things and also open my eyes to how much ability I have and enjoy. Tara, co-sign to that for sure. Okay, thank you. Keep those coming. So, when we're looking at our organizational practices and culture, it's, and decisions in general. It's so important that we are constantly taking an intersectional analysis to our decision-making. And so when we say an intersectional analysis, what we mean is that we shift from the single ground perspective to an analysis that is based on the assumption that individuals um, experience the world through multitude of identities, right? And that our multitude of identities can be linked to more than one ground of either discrimination or privilege. 
here's some examples of, of discrimination and intersectionality. 30, 30 um, uh, uh, states currently do not have, uh, do not ban discrimination uh, against sexual orientation and gender identity in the workplace. This means that it is completely legal in 30 of our states to fire, evict, deny services to someone for being LGBTQ. This means um, in relation to adoption, health coverage, et cetera. Another example of this is that family leave laws do not extend to same-sex couples in states like Michigan, North Dakota, and Virginia. This also helps sustain discriminatory adoption and fostering policies. Another example, currently we have five times as many LGBTQ parents willing to adopt than there are foster children uh, available for adoption and care. We could literally solve the foster care crisis, the adoption crisis tomorrow if we simply eliminated the discriminatory adoption practices. Um, I'll give you a, a personal story. Um, a dear friend of mine and her partner, uh, when they adopted, uh, sorry, when they were fostering their children, um, both of them could be the legal guardian, the legal temporary guardian of their child. Uh, when they officially adopted the child that they were fostering, because they were a same-sex couple, only one of the parents was allowed to be the legal guardian. This means that you know, universe forbid, if one of the partners were to uh, become deceased, uh, if that partner that, that had passed was the legal guardian, the child could very much so at, be at risk of returning back into the foster care system, into the uh, social services system. In terms of discrimination and intersectionality in the workplace, um, how many of you knew that women were not allowed to get a business loan without a male co-signer until 1988? Raise your hand if you knew that. Raise your hand if you knew that spousal rape was not illegal until 1993. Keep your hand raised if you knew that credit card discrimination was legal, meaning women were not allowed to get a credit card in their own name until 1974. Keep your hand raised if you knew that workplace sexual harassment was legal until 1980. You can place your hands down now. So often as, as humans, we tend to use what I like to call lazy logic to explain certain circumstances in society. As an example, um, when we see the, the disparity in representation of women in fields like engineering, we tend to excuse it away by saying, well, women just aren't interested in math and science, right? Rather than actually asking the question, what barriers exist that are prohibiting women from accessing this field. Um, we do the same with conservation. We tell ourselves that, well, people of color just aren't interested in conservation and land stewardship and wildlife biology or um, water reclamation, right? Rather than actually asking what practices are we engaging in that are keeping our organizations and our candidate pools racially homogenous. I like to show this image because it again helps us to um, further evaluate from an intersectional lens how identity intersects and overlaps to offer us experiences of either privilege or oppression. This is why it is also so critical that we pause when we find ourselves engaging in mindsets that tell us that certain <clears throat> things are just certain things are just so. Um, uh, because that's just the way the world is, rather than actually evaluating, um, is my perception that this is not a problem simply because my identity absolves me from experiencing the problems connected here? Um, like, do I have some blind spots perhaps that are contributing to my perception? I want you to take a moment, uh, and if you have a piece of paper, even better, and I want you to draw an iceberg. In that iceberg, I want you to think about all the components of your identity, 
but think of it from the standpoint of which parts of your identity are above the waterline, meaning that they are visible to the outside world, and which parts of your identity are less salient, parts that you would need to share verbally um, or explicitly with someone for them to know these things. So for example, I present um, uh, outwardly as female. Um, I, I'm also very visibly, as I like to say, vertically challenged. You can't tell on the screen, but I am five feet tall. <laughs> Um, and so these are things to my part of my identity that are very um, above the waterline. Um, I also appear to be very physically able-bodied, so, um, but I also have uh, underneath the waterline, I have Tourette's syndrome and I have chronic pain. These are things that you may not see unless I explicitly shared them with you. So think about that from your own identity as well. Your formal education, um, your political views, um, what life experiences you've had that have informed those political views, um, those spiritual beliefs or lack thereof. Um, culture, food, uh, music, family status, the region that you live in, right? Are you in a rural re uh, area or are you in an urban area? Or are you in a suburban area? Languages that you speak. Are you a third culture kid, for example? Did you grow up in a culture that is different from your own and from your parents? Or did you grow up in a culture that was very homogenous, where everyone you knew had a very similar upbringing? And when you're done, I'd love to invite one volunteer to share uh, uh, maybe a couple things that they put above the waterline and a couple things that they put below the waterline. Again, this is totally challenged by choice. <laughs> Do you want to listen to this? Is there anyone who would like to share their um, their uh, iceberg? And I, I did mute some folks. So if you please do unmute yourself if you'd like to share. Okay, Jerry, go right ahead. Above the line, I'm a white male, relatively slim, able-bodied old man. Um, Below the line, um, I'm educated, uh, relatively wealthy. Um, I live in a on, on, on the border of of, of uh, urban suburban, um, with a uh, I don't know what you call it a <clears throat> an an intact nuclear family um, that there are no. Um, uh, Two kids, although one is adopted and, and uh, of, of color. Um, I'm Jewish. Um, I'm a leftist. Um, to various different skills and talents, but those are all below the line. Um, I'm a first generation American. So I was born in this country, but my parents were immigrants. Um, I think that's about it. Thank you so much, Jerry. So friends, remember, think about these concepts, right? These concepts of dominance and non-dominance, how they intersect and overlap. Again, if we, the more we are conscientious of how our identity has meaning, the more we can work to make sure that those parts, uh, those identity factors don't determine who gets to thrive, right? This work is not about ignoring parts of our identity or ignoring the identity of others, pretending like we don't see color, we don't see gender orientation or disability and things like that. 
the goal is for us to acknowledge that those things absolutely inform how we walk throughout the world, how we move throughout the world, um, and to check in with ourselves about what we have normalized, what we've assumed to be the status quo, um, and whether or not uh, what is accessible to us is accessible to all others. Let's talk a little bit about socioeconomics. Um, because this is very much so um, connected uh, to forms of power, such as wealth, um, access to resources, land, right, property. So currently, the top 1% of our nation holds 20% of our nation's wealth. And the bottom 50% of our nation's population holds 12% of the nation's wealth. Now, you may recall when we discuss issues around pay equity, it's oftentimes in reference to the binary genders, such as men and women or male and female. But what's important to also note is that when we look at that data um, intersectionally, we can see that there's also a key difference in um, where, when, where race is concerned, right? So, um, so women of color actually earn even less than the average white person in comparison to what white men are earning per hour. So some modern day implications of wealth inequality are reminding us again of our first workshop together uh, that the federal government has backed over $120 billion of home loans. And to date, more than 98% of those funds that were funded by the tax levy went exclusively to white individuals. And non-white veterans uh, were often unable to access education loans due to segregationist university policies. And the Social Security Act explicitly excluded domestic and wage workers, so farm, um, which, which disproportionately impacted people of color when it was first instituted. Um, in fact, 75% of the Black population fell into that category uh, upon the creation of the Social Security Act. The Wagner Act allowed for labor union monopolies and allowed discrimination of membership based on gender and race. And non-whites were unable to utilize VA home loans and access mortgages due to racist banking and insurance practices. Couple that with racially restrictive covenants and redlining, and we have what we're facing today, which is an enormous wealth disparity uh, in terms of, of uh, not only money, but also property. So here's a graph from the Brookings uh, Institute where it shows that white households hold 84% of the nation's wealth and black households hold 4% of the nation's wealth. This is very much so directly uh, correlated with the labor theft that has occurred um, across the nation. Um, in fact, if any of you have ever, as a sidebar, if any of you have ever wondered why countries, for example, like Haiti, are so economically poor, uh, it is because uh, Haiti to this day is still paying restitution to France um, for uh, the freedom of the enslaved individuals who escaped and uh, uh, went to, uh, to Haiti. But that's a whole other workshop. <laughs> Uh, when we look at the wealth disparity across um, race, age, and gender, we can also see that white men are at the absolute top, earning or holding rather on average around $220,000 in household wealth, whereas black men are at the, the bottom echelon holding just under $50,000. Um, actually, it's, I think it's around $35,000 uh, in, in household wealth. As a reminder, in 1971, President Nixon declared the war on drugs and identified drug abuse as public enemy number one. This meant that between 1974 and 2014, our federal prison population increased by over 6,000%. Now, keep in mind, uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation, which um, uh, freed the slaves in the southern uh, states, not in the north, uh, uh, President Lincoln also passed the uh, the 13th Amendment, which indicated that anyone who had been convicted of a crime could be placed in slavery. 
So while of slavery was quote unquote absolved uh, uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation, it was put right back into action with the 13th Amendment, which is still active today. And what is producing is allowing for our prison industrial complex to be so wealthy uh, because it is le completely legal to farm out the labor of incarcerated individuals to private industry. The Clinton and the Reagan administrations expanded this war on drugs, increasing um, uh, sentencing for nonviolent drug offenses and consequently increasing uh, the prison population from 50,000 people to 400 by 1997. So here's how this shakes out again today, right? Um, we talk about race um, so significantly uh, when we are discussing issues of equity because when we when all other things are measured or managed for and equal, race continues to be the key determining factor of thriving um, across uh, uh, all other identities. So here we can see that even though white individuals are using illicit drugs uh, at a higher rate than black individuals, blacks are still overrepresented in the prison population and are more likely to be incarcerated for nonviolent drug related crimes than actual likelihood of using drugs. Now I wanna go back to the comment I made about prison labor, which is by the way, a billion dollar uh, industry. You may notice, uh, you may be aware of some of these um, uh, various uh, household names and brands. So, only about 10 corporations control the majority of the household products that we buy. And it's actually unknown how big the prison labor industry actually is because there's no uh, nationwide suppository of information. Most of our prison systems are doing their own tracking um, around uh, prison labor. The last nationwide census of prisons was conducted in 2005. So we're definitely overdue for one. And at the time, 1.5 million incarcerated people were working in industries such as manufacturing, uh, which currently makes up about 4% of that industry. So, um, as I mentioned before, not only do individual prison systems and states uh, decide how they're going to count um, and regulate their prison labor, uh, they also have uh, essentially carte blanche to determine how that prison labor um, is, is sold out, essentially. So some companies that have utilized prison labor include Whole Foods. Uh, in fact, prior to 2016, Whole Foods in particular sold a 12-pound bag of tilapia that they had labeled as from sustainable American family farms. But in truth, uh, that product was actually produced by Colorado prisoners who were making about 74 cents a day. Uh, the same can be said for the um, fancy goat cheeses and artisanal cheeses that Whole Foods sells as well, which the majority of that um, is produced by Colorado uh, Department of Corrections. Victoria's Secret also came under fire in years past um, the 90s specifically uh, for its contract uh, with third generation, which uh, required inmates in South Carolina to um, changed the labels on their um, garments uh, from stating that they were made in Honduras to made in America. And a whistleblowing inmate uh, was noted to be placed in solitary confinement uh, for, for uh, disclosing that information. McDonald's also utilizes prison labor in the creation of its staff uniforms and in the production of many of its frozen food items. Unicor, uh, which is uh, the entity that oversees um, uh, the, the legal components of prison labor, uh, essentially uh, requires that any inmate uh, that is not a security risk or has any health exception is required to work for either Unicor or some other prison um, job. Uh, Unicor is state owned um, and it is the entity responsible for contracting out workers to private companies. It was established in 1934. Um, this also allows for private prisons to charge the government $150 per day per inmate. So essentially, um, this creates quite a demand to fill all of those beds. Um, so every bed that's filled is $150 for these private companies. 
Currently, we have about 1.8 million people incarcerated. So I'm sure you all can do the math. Um, I will note, however, that due to significant work around prison reform, that number is down from 2.18 um, uh, in 2018, specifically because of reform measures that have taken place in New York and California. So just goes to show that um, activism does work, policy change does work, and it's quite frankly the only way that we're going to, um, to solve for these inequitable practices. If you're curious about more information around prison labor, uh, I invite you to uh, take a look at the Marshall Project. If you're wondering why I'm talking about prison labor uh, during a conversation about workforce practices um, to a, a, a group of environmentalists, it is because the conservation industry also utilizes prison labor. Um, we utilize it to put out our forest fires. We utilize them to do land restoration work. And many of our land stewardship organizations and land trusts would not be able to conduct the work that they do and, and to serve the land that they work on without the utilization of prison labor. So what I recommend we, we do as individuals who benefit from incarceration uh, as institutions ourselves is to advocate for more just practices, to advocate for the restitution of the Pell Grant for individuals who've been incarcerated, um, to advocate uh, in our own practices of hiring individuals who have um, create, conducted service on lands that we uh, own or have acquired. If you go to the Marshall Project, um, you can uh, get some data, again, further on state prisons and local jails. You can also find data there around how many individuals are actually held in uh, incarceration that haven't even been convicted of a crime, which as of the time of this poll of this image, it's over 400,000 people who simply are too poor to make bail or are not able to make bail, um, and therefore they are just waiting in jail while their families go without um, income um, and without their loved ones. So Unicor, um, from the last pull of this information, manages around 83 factories around the United States. As of 2021, inmates are reported to have earned an average of between 23 cents uh, to $1.15 per hour. And according to Unicor's most recent report, it employs more than 17,000 incarcerated workers that do everything from heavy manufacturing to computer-aided design. And it brings in, um, alone, just Unicor, over $50 million of revenue annually. Okay, so moving on to further explain uh, the gateways to social class theory beyond socioeconomics, we're going to look at why, um, why socioeconomic status uh, and experiences should be factored into our inclusion efforts in our organizations. And the number one reason, friends, is that most of our organizations, um, social norms and practices and policies are very much so created by and tailored for white middle-class norms and values. Here's what I mean by that. Many of our traditional workplaces are skewed to support middle-class norms and often don't account for what an individual who comes from a more financially challenged background might struggle with in terms of day-to-day -day, um, office life culture. And the way that our companies operate with regards to salary, higher education, time management, meetings, public speaking opportunities, and travel are all influenced by the creators of that culture bosses who were likely raised with middle-class norms and values that feel totally foreign to someone who was not raised under those similar circumstances. So those with middle-class upbringings are more likely to be equipped with a savings account, with a basic understanding of financial planning, and quite often, as even as a last resort, have the accessibility of their family funds to support them in the event of a backup plan being needed or an emergency. This is a reality that employees from lower income backgrounds simply don't have access to. So when we talk about class, we're referring to the relative status according to one's income, wealth, and power and position. 
Now we can make a lot of distinctions between working class, low income, middle class, et cetera. Um, but this is also something that is deeply interconnected with our race, with our gender, with our sexual orientation, our religion, our age, our immigration status, the location that we reside in. It also makes it really challenging to separate out as a factor on its own um, because it can tend to overlook other dynamics within a particular group. Class-based segregation can also generate feelings of guilt for those who come from a more privileged position and shame for those who come from a less privileged position. These factors also make classism something that is very difficult to talk about and manage effectively. Our relationship to socioeconomics starts very young. It starts primarily in the home with the messaging that we receive around opportunities and resources uh, for class mobility. As children, we learn various hidden rules that we rely upon for our own survival. And the way that our parents or our legal guardians communicate also reinforces our perception around opportunities and resources. So as an example, um, for parents, and again, I'm going to make a generalization here, but for parents who, um, who whose origin uh, socioeconomically is working class, there, there tends to be uh, a certain approach to parenting, which is all about ending the threat, right? So for example, I, as a, let's say, you know, I'm little Augie and I am, you know, acting out in school. And my mother says, Augie, knock it off. <laughs> Don't ever do that again, right? And it's not a conversation, it's a demand. It's a, it's a, it, it's a uh, requirement, right? Whereas for a household maybe that is more, uh, where a parent grew up in a more middle-class to generationally wealthy background, the approach to the misbehavior might be now Augie. Was that the best decision you could have made for yourself? What might happen if you continue to function this way in school? What do you notice that's different about those two approaches? Any thoughts on that? Agency, yes, exactly, choice. Yeah, one is authoritarian and one is about empowering, right? Yeah. Command versus conversation, yeah. So let's talk about what it means um, to survive, right? Well, survival means different things based on the social class that you may have been raised within. And those of you, that, that one example I just gave for those of you who come from a household where maybe each of your parents came from two different socioeconomic backgrounds, you might notice as we're talking about these things, like, Oh, that's why my, my father, you know, communicates that way. And that's why my mother communicates this way. Um, so some hidden rules or concepts for survival. Now, I borrow from the work of Ruth Payne, which admittedly, there are some criticisms um, to, to her work as well. Uh, but I try not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So um, I want us to consider these concepts. So for working class individuals, the, the hidden rules or concepts for survival are based in relationship building, entertainment, and survival itself. For the middle class, I'm oh, sorry, for the upper class or what I like to call the generationally wealthy, the hidden rules or concepts for survival or that factors that contribute to survival are financial relationships, political relationships, and social connection. For the middle class, the value system specifically around achievement, work itself, and self-sufficiency. Take a moment to consider these hidden rules or hidden factors of survival to see if there's any alignment perhaps with your experiences. August, can you elaborate on entertainment a little bit? There was a question in the chat as well, and I'm curious about it. Yeah, so entertainment being um, you enjoy, there's escapism, right? Like really enjoying telenovelas or, um, you know, kind of escapism with 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 media, music, um, because it, it gives one a sense of agency, a sense of like, um, 
like uh, um, you, you enjoy the moment for what it is because, well, tomorrow we got to get right back out, you know, working. And like, so there's no time to like dreaming essentially versus like actually doing the thing. Um, so the Thank value you. is, on, yeah. yeah, like kind of like managing stress in a way. Um, thank you for that question. Let's talk about our school system for a moment. Our schools also uh, definitely play a role in reinforcing messages around um, uh, resources and opportunities. How this might show up, for example, in a school system is for a working school, a working class school, the the relationship to resources might be communicated in a manner like this. Okay, Billy, you can totally borrow those crayons, but put them right back in the art closet so the other children can use them, right? Um, so the messaging there, right, is maybe one of scarcity, one of communal property, whereas for a more generationally wealthy school, the relationship to resources might be, did everyone bring, you know, their, their, their crayons, right? Um, take care of your own property, G you know, give Jill her crayons back. Those aren't yours. Those are Jill's, that's Jill's property, right? Um, so there's a lot more emphasis on um, everyone having what they need, everyone coming prepared with their own stuff, which we then take that mentality again, right, into adulthood. There's also some interesting interactions with students and teachers too. Um, so for example, uh, students who are um, first generation uh, college students, for example, might feel um, less equipped to advocate for themselves in certain settings because they don't have anyone else in their family who's who've navigated that institution of higher education before. And this is something that transpires across race and gender too, but obviously we know that those things play into this. Um, now many universities have recognized um, this hidden rule, right, that comes up and have created um, support systems uh, within their, their schools to support first-generation college students, but, but we know that there's still a lot more work that can be done. Um, in fact, one of the main reasons for uh, unpaid student loan debt is uh, that students who come from a more financially challenged background may have had to leave school to take care of an ailing parent or family member. And then because they were receiving financial aid, they could not go back to school um, until they had paid off their financial aid uh, that they had borrowed. And so it kind of creates a suspicious cycle of, well, now I have this debt and I have no degree, <laughs> right? Um, so when we look at, oops, sorry, when we look at schools and access, 3% um, of the students at the highest ranking schools across the nation um, come from the bottom economic percentile, whereas 74% of the students at our top universities and colleges come from the upper to middle class homes. When it comes to autonomy, working class schools are more known to prepare students for working class jobs that require higher supervision and less autonomy. I, I saw someone in the chat mention autonomy. Whereas upper to middle class schools tend to reflect and promote more expressive ideals. Um, there are more complex and varied tasks that students are given. Students are encouraged to ask more questions. Um, they're prepared for jobs where they'll have more autonomy and where they'll be making decisions. Now, again, I want to state that this is very much so a blanket statement, but based on the research of Darling and Hammond, this is what they found after looking at hundreds and hundreds of school systems based on socioeconomic status. When it comes to interactions at the school, working class students uh, might be ignored by their teachers um, who are already overworked and might have a larger class size and might see um, uh, uh, their, their, their seeking of uh, a help might be viewed as a weakness versus curiosity. Whereas in upper and middle class school systems, students are, uh, ask teachers more questions and that intellectual curiosity is encouraged. So, and when it comes to parental advocacy, 
working class parents have less knowledge typically that's required to advocate for their child. So meaning they might not have um, the resources to, to get the support that is needed for a child that might have um, a learning disability or might um, have ADD or ADHD, for example. Whereas upper and middle class parents are more likely to take charge and influence their parent, uh, their, sorry, their child's education. But what we also found from the study from Ray in 1998 is that both parents, all parents, regardless of socioeconomic background, are all equally invested and interested and concerned with their child's education, which is often not the perception that teachers and administrators have in school systems uh, based on um, socioeconomic background. But, but the actual issue is that it's really a matter of the skills and ability to advocate um, that are unequal. Moving further into the workplace, um, we're going to cover like what role do politics and behavior and power play? And now we, when we say politics, I'm not necessarily referring to, um, uh, you know, like our political frame around like conservatives and, and, and progressives and things like that, but more so just politics in general, politicking um, within the workplace. Uh, this means that for, for, the current system, the current workplace, um, the higher up you go in an organization, the more likely that you will be required to participate in political behavior, right? Doing kind of navigating um, relationships with people, kind of playing a certain role. Um, different uh, different individuals and groups from different backgrounds have a different relationship to that. Um, it's very much so um, an issue around um, authenticity, but then also effectiveness. Managers also tend to have some assumptions about what makes an ideal employee. Um, for, I, I don't think I have a slide on this one, but it's important for me to note uh, that there was some research done around uh, the model minority myth in that many managers uh, uh, stated one way or another that they felt that Asian Americans were an ideal employee uh, because they followed directions and you know didn't uh, ruffle any feathers and were accommodating and kind of all of these very beta char characteristics that were a stereotype of an entire identity group. And one might think that those are really positive things, but what we see happening in addition to the, the just one very um, problematic nature of those broadband assumptions about an entire identity group is that we see those, those stereotypes contributing to a bias against Asian Americans when it comes for leadership roles. Because those same characteristics that an employer tends to value in their employees are not the characteristics that they are looking for in a leader. And so it is very much so common for one, you know, for a top performing employee who may happen to be Asian American to be consistently overlooked for a position of leadership because of the racism and, and, and uh, stereotypes uh, that are held by those in power of that organization. So there's two types of behavior that I want to highlight that shows up in the workplace. And one is pro-social behavior and one is political. So pro-social behavior tends to focus on collaboration with concern around mutual benefit to all, whereas political behavior is about self-promotion, self-advocacy, um, treating others as resources. Now, it's important that I state here that both of these behaviors, like one is not right or wrong, although for, for many of you on the call, just hearing these examples might trigger you to have a certain response one way or another based on your own values and norms that you've been raised with and been inundated with. But both of these um, types of behavior um, are valuable in the workplace. What's problematic is when one or the other is treated as the right way <laughs> um, without valuing that the other way of functioning also has value based on um, the situation. Uh, how, if you had to guess, um, what behavior do you think comes more organic to working class individuals, pro-social or political? Yeah, okay, see a lot of pro-social, yeah. And so for middle and upper class folks, political behavior tends to be more common, right, is more of the unspoken norm and way of functioning. So 
Employees who belong to the working class were less likely, and this is a study done by Bell Mulern and Larson Friedman, both times they found that employees who belong to the working class were less likely um, to aspire or to seek out um, higher level positions if they felt that it required engagement in political behavior. So again, it wasn't that the individuals from the working class felt they weren't qualified or couldn't do the job. They just, the, 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 the assumption that they would have to engage in political behavior bumped up so much against the values that they had been raised in that they declined to pursue the, the opportunity. Working class employees were also paid up to 20% less than their middle and upper class counterparts. And again, there's a multitude of reasons for this, right? It's, um, and again, this is also where gender can play a role in this, right? Where if you are, uh, don't have the education or training of how to advocate for yourself, negotiate salaries. Um, the other component too, I think we talked about this in one of our last sessions, um, that, you know, women apply for positions. Oh no, you know, we haven't talked about this yet. This is in our next session, but I'll share it here now. Um, there was a study done a few years ago that saw that women um, will apply for jobs when they meet about 60, oh, sorry, when they meet 100% of the requirements, whereas on average men apply for a position when they meet about 60% of the qualifications. Um, and it then begs the question uh, or beg the question of, well, is this simply an issue of a lack of confidence for women or do women even get hired when they do apply for jobs where they don't meet 100 or more <laughs> percent of the qualifications? And what a, I'll try to find the study for our next workshop, but actually what they found was the latter. It was that there is a history of when women apply for a position um, that they don't have 100 percent of the qualifications for, they typically don't get the job. They typically have to over qualify to, in order to, to be hired for the position. Um, and so women tend to be hired for positions uh, based on proven past track record. Men are oftentimes hired for the potential um, of what the employer, the interviewer thinks they can accomplish, which is quite interesting. Um, so, okay. So here's some common ways that bias continues to impact workplace experiences. Um, employers tend to show a preference for higher social class. We'll talk about how that shows up. White supremacy is often veiled as professionalism. Affinity bias, right? We all, we like people who are like us, right? We just feel like that's easier. Um, and there's also feedback bias. So when we say class bias or uh, social class bias, um, the Harvard Business Review conducted a study where they looked uh, at the number of interview invitations a, a, a candidate pool received based on the projection of having a higher class versus a lower class using the resume audit method. And what they found was that men who presented themselves as coming from a higher class um, received an invitation to interview more than 16.2% um, uh, of the time, sorry, 16.25% of the time, uh, whereas women um, received a uh, uh, an interview invitation when they presented a having a higher class, um, you know, 3.8% of the time. Whereas women who came from a lower cl class background actually were invited to interview more often than men who came from a lower socioeconomic class. Um, so here's how this kind of shaked up. The higher socioeconomic class was presented um, through their resumes in terms of what types of athletic awards they had listed on their resumes, noting classical music as an interest, and then also noting sailing and polo as some sports that they're engaged in. Uh, the, the interviewers um, assumed a lower socioeconomic class for candidates that listed awards for athletics on financial aid, country music as a musical interest, and track and field or pickup soccer um, as, as an interest as well. And again, the study was done um, by the Harvard Business Review. White supremacy veiled as professionalism. Now, um, across the globe, but primarily in the United States, especially the, the European three-piece suit is known and, and heralded as the, uh, the top echelon of professional attire. Um, but why, it begs the question of why don't we value the corta, which is also a formal piece of attire as a professional um, piece of clothing. 
Some of you may be familiar with the Crown Act that recently passed and is also actually being contested right now, um, which essentially makes it illegal for an employer to, uh, and a school to discriminate uh, against someone based on uh, their hair, specifically um, uh, their natural state of their hair or wearing their hair in what's known as protective styles. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, African-American hair, hair that is um, kinky, uh, does not function well uh, in just, you know, in, in the average climate, and therefore it needs to be worn in protective styling so that it does not break off. Um, but prior to the Crown Act, it was completely legal for an employer to um, either not hire or fire an individual for wearing their hair um, in the natural um, kinky curly state or for wearing protective styles such as braids um, and locks. Uh, you may have seen many examples of um, student athletes being forced to cut their hair in order to play um, uh, and compete in certain sports. And these, these are all, almost always children of color at the hands of white individuals in power. I wanna pause here perhaps to give us a, um, a five minute bio break. Um, but before then, I wanna see, are there any quote questions before we take a five minute bio break about what we've covered so far? Or any comments, anything that you'd like to share with others? I'd like to ask, what would you suggest to the attendees with all of the information and stats and everything that you are sharing, which is quite a bit, which could be un unnerving, it could be um, challenging to say the least, how would you suggest that persons embrace or, or interrogate, embrace, however, this information in such a way that it could be useful and not just put your own edge and make you feel like, oh my goodness, what's wrong or guilt or all of that kind of stuff that could come with the magnitude of statistics that have been shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the most succinct way I can put that put this is to ask the question, who might be unduly burdened and who might be unduly benefited from this practice, right? So for example, if you are requiring, if you're combing through your resumes or your, your sorry, your job descriptions and you are requiring that one has a master's degree what is it about the master's degree that you feel um, is a requirement for that job? Can the skills that one could be perceived to have by having a master's degree be met in another manner? Does everyone, do all candidates have access to a master's degree, right? Are there, is there any disparities in, in that field? So so yeah, the, the, the most succinct and simple way I can put it is, this session is intended to build awareness of how practices can produce inequities. And so asking ourselves the question at every turn, how can I take an intersectional analysis to this practice or policy? And does this practice or policy either interrupt or promote inequities? Um, and I do see the note about um, uh, Black versus African American, and I, I just want to note that I, I do use those terms interchangeably, but yes. Um, thank you for that. And I put in the chat that it wasn't just the, the uh, present facts and stats that you were talking about, but just the whole, all of it from the beginning mm -hmm. of this session to now, because it's a lot. And, yeah. and um, not just for... Uh, you know, individuals and wherever the categories and all of the isms and the schisms and all of that, but just generally speaking, it is a lot. And so how persons can go from this session to um, utilizing the information without being overwhelmed by it and demonizing uh, anybody else and their thoughts or whatever, but just to, to uh, uh, even creatively engage mm -hmm. the information to make it useful and not be a burden at every level. So I cannot promise that people will not feel burdened or guilt. Um, that is a that is unfortunately a, a personal um, responsibility of how people 
um, respond. I, I absolutely take ownership for the energy I bring into a space. Um, but I, I also, and I'm not just speaking to to to, to Deborah. This is for everyone. Um, I often refer to guilt. Uh, I define it rather as stifled empathy. If we actually acknowledge that what we're feeling is a frustration towards inequity, a frustration towards unfairness, then it, it's more empowering to acknowledge that and state, how can I fix this? What with, with my identity, with where I stand in society, what, what leverage do I have um, to shift this? What can I voice? Um, and looking at it from that perspective, we we can't change what we don't face, right? And for so many of us, it's it's very easy to simply not face um, the circumstances that have produced the realities that we are working to remediate today. So that is, that is my response to, to that. Um, I did see the question about um, feedback bias. I will share that when we get uh, when we come back. We haven't gotten to that point yet. Okay, so let's take a five minute bio break. I have 1017 Central right now. And then when we come back, we will continue on. Thank you so much, friends. We are going to get started. I'm just moving a slide around. Apologies. Where did it go? There we are. All right. So um, before we get into um, feedback bias, I want to talk a bit more about another concept that is connected to um, identity, and that is uh, chronemics. Uh, chronemics are essentially our relationship to time. And this is a very cultural thing. So it is not only individual, but it's also cultural and, and societal. Uh, raise your hand if you are familiar with the term chronemics. Okay, Mario, I see your hand. Anyone else? Who do we have here? Andrea, okay, and Douglas. Okay, so a couple, yeah. So it's a sociological term for those who are on Juliana. Thank you. So for folks who may not be um, familiar. Okay, I'm gonna turn off my video so that um, hopefully it reduces buffering. And we're gonna watch um, around like the perceived time relationships. We can't hear it. Oh, okay. thank you. You cannot hear. Okay, let's see. It seems as though the volume, volume might need to be turned up. Yeah, it is optimized it for this. So let's try this now. Is that better? Time is perceived differently across yes. cultures. Yes. Often a culture's sense of time is so ingrained that few people consider it in a broader context until they come smack into contact with people who tick at a different speed and operate under different assumptions. People who view time in a polychronic manner may change plans frequently, consider schedules as goals instead of imperatives, and focus on relationships with people. Those who view time as linear and scheduled have a monochronic manner towards time. We tend to think of Asian countries and Latin American countries as being polychronic. France is too. South and Southeast Asia are considered polychronic, but Japan is monochronic, and China is somewhere in between, more monochronic than polychronic. US, Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, monochronic. How does this difference in time affect us? 
Strong polychronic cultures may have an aversion to rigid deadlines. With colleagues and business partners from polychronic cultures, it can be a mistake to set rigid deadlines and try to enforce them. Instead, putting a comfortable margin in your scheduling and maintaining as close a relationship with your counterpart as possible is key. In highly polychronic cultures, relationships count for far more than arbitrary deadlines. Is one style better than the other? It is implied that monochronic procedures are superior to polychronic in terms of productivity. Monochronic time to be easier to control and coordinate. Monochronicity is seen to be well suited to the management of large systems. Most organizations take monochronicity for granted as the only way to get things done efficiently. On the other hand, Polychronic time is considered to be more effective in building relationships and in solving complex problems. It's more suitable in the developmental stages of an organization for smaller systems and for organizations where one gifted person is the central point of coordination. Do these two ever blend? Technology enables us to involve ourselves simultaneously in several tasks which are located at different places. Technology is enhancing the polychronic dimension through allowing multitasking and the ability to mix work and personal life through using devices. Technology allows contingent scheduling of activities around local circumstances, supporting both monochronic sequential ordering and polychronic attention to multiple information sources action. Okay, so um, a good example of uh, where chronemics can sort of um, cause some conflict, for example, is when you're conducting meetings, right? So as an example, an individual who has a more monochronic relationship to time uh, may be, and oh, Laura, can you keep track of the um, the waiting room? I, I see some folks have been waiting to get in. Um, I, I just let folks in, but, uh, but for folks who are monochronic, we might think that starting a meeting right on time is the most professional and polite thing to do. Whereas for folks who are polychronic, they might perceive um, uh, starting a meeting before everyone has arrived as rude, right? So consider that uh, when you're engaging in community engagement events, right? Um, you know, is your audience largely monochronic, polychronic, or a mix? Most of the time, they're going to be a mix. And so thinking in advance how you can manage for that uh, will allow for folks to feel uh, more included, that their time is valued, et cetera. Um, I find that uh, when I'm doing community engagement projects, it's uh, ideal for me to build in a buffer for folks' uh, arrival. And so in order to maintain the respect for those who have come right on time, I might have a, a do now activity uh, that I would do with them for the first five minutes um, so that they are still engaged and not waiting around for those who have not yet arrived. Um, I've, I had experience with a client who was holding an international Zoom meeting uh, with some folks in Zimbabwe, and uh, this very thing occurred where uh, the meeting, I believe, was, was set for 12 p.m. Central. I think that was the time. Uh, and the um, the representatives from Zimbabwe did not arrive until I think like 1230. And once everyone was there, then the leader of the uh, of the, the Zoom call said, okay, we're all here, we can begin now, <laughs> right? And the individuals from, um, from England and from the States were like, how rude, right? But it's simply a misunderstanding, one, of, rela of relationships to time. Um, so for chronic, oh, so, sorry, monochronic individuals, it's more likely that we will do things um, one at a time. Whereas for folks who are raised in a more polychronic environment, it's more likely to we're more likely to multitask and do multiple things at one time. A monochronic approach to time also means that we might concentrate on one job, uh, whereas for polychronic individuals, um, they're more uh, able to manage distra distractions easily and to, to um, kind of flip flop between different tasks. 
Monochronicity requires that we adhere religiously to plans. We start on time, we end on time. Uh, whereas polychronic individuals are more committed to people and human relationships. And so, you know, if someone is sharing a very heartfelt story and, you know, we're now two minutes over the meeting time or five minutes over the meeting time, they're more likely to allow the person to continue sharing their story and they will just apologize, you know, to the next person that they're meeting with that they relate because uh, the value is on uh, human relationships versus tasks. The other component to, to polychronicity uh, is that we consider an objective to be achieved, it, to be achieved rather, if possible, um, and we're more likely to change plans often and easily. Whereas for monochronic um, societies, there's a deep concern around not disturbing others and also following rules of privacy. Um, Whereas for polychronic individuals, um, they're more concerned with, how, uh, sorry, privacy is more relative to how closely related you are to the person you're in communication with. Um, there's also a more, a higher value placed on property, less likely to borrow and lend things, whereas a polychronic um, community or society uh, or individual tends to have a more communal approach to, to items. Again, that emphasis on promptness for monochronic individuals and societies. Um, and then for polychronic individuals and societies, the promptness is based upon the relationship. So it varies, right? Um, for monochronic individuals and societies, we're more likely to sacrifice the relationship in order to complete the task. Whereas for polychronic individuals and societies, the task is more likely to get sacrificed to protect the relationship. There's also a tendency to build more lifetime um, relationships. Uh, and then monochronic relationships are also more low context, which we're going to get to next, whereas polychronic uh, societies tend to be more high context, which I'll talk about next. Yeah, uh, Kayla says, I wonder how this correlates with the colors personality profiles. Yeah, very, very much so. Oh, um, August, I just want to let you know that we can see your control bar if you want to. Yeah, I'm not sure how to. Hmm. Change that. It's because you have it set to optimize for video. So if you take that off again, it'll. Oh, thank you. Okay, there we go. Is that better? <laughs> Thanks, friends. We're only two years in to this this Zoom life, right? You think I'd have it sorted by now? <laughs> okay. So now we're going to talk about high versus low context cultures. Anyone familiar with these terms? Cool. Let's see. Oh, a couple of people. Yeah. Awesome. We must have some sociologists on the call. All right. Let me know if I need to change the um, sound again. In a low context society, uh, while we are communicating, we assume that we have a low level of shared context. What does that mean? It means that we don't have the same reference points or the same body of knowledge or relationships, that we have a low level of shared context. So in a low context society, we believe that good, effective, professional communication is a communication that's very explicit, that's very simple and very clear. In a low context society, we're trained that if I want you to understand blue, then I have to say blue. Literally, we're trained in a low context culture that if I give a presentation, I should tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I should tell you, and then I should tell you what I've told you. Why do I tell you the same thing three times? Because we're focused overall on making sure that the message was passed simply and clearly. In a high context society, while we're communicating, we assume or consider that we have a larger body of shared context that we have the same reference points, body of knowledge, information. And because we assume all of this shared context, in a high context society, we believe good, effective communication is a communication that's more implicit or layered or nuanced. I had a German individual who said to me, you know, Aaron, in Germany, at the end of a meeting, we almost always do a recap. First, we do a verbal recap, and then we do a written recap. That's low context, right? Clarification, clarification, clarification. 
He said, now that I've been working frequently with the French, I often find that at the end of a meeting, I'll get ready to do a recap, and my French colleagues will just stand up. And someone will say, et voila, there it is. And I'll think to myself, but voila, what? And then I'll be very surprised to see that it just seems that people know what's been decided, that they know what's supposed to happen next without going through all of those levels of clarification that I'm so used to in my own culture. I had a second example. I was uh, doing some work a while ago in Istanbul, and I had a Turkish client who was telling me about all of these issues that uh, he was having with his new American boss. And I said, when your boss was here, did you tell him what you're telling me now? And he said, well, you know, Aaron, I made it known so that he could see it if he wanted to see it. And I thought to myself, he probably didn't see it, right? I'll give you a third example from China. I was giving a, a presentation at a conference in China last year, and all the people in the room worked for the same multinational American company. Before I worked with them, the chairman, who was this American from New York City, gave a presentation that went very well, and then he left. Afterwards, when I was working with the group, we were talking about this, and I had the Chinese human resource director raise his hand, and he said, you know, Aaron, this concept is very interesting to me, because the whole time the chairman was talking, I was trying to make sure that I was listening with all of my senses, that I was picking up all of the levels of meaning that he might be trying to pass. Now that I look at this, I'm asking myself the question, is it possible that there was no meaning beyond that, you know, first those simple words that he was saying? And I thought to myself that that chairman would have been really surprised to know, think that anyone was trying to understand his message beyond the first degree. Sure. High versus low context cultures tend to show up in very particular ways, right? So in a high context culture, people tend to feel responsible for their family. Uh, the value on the concept of face and a strong public image is very much so uh, strong. And a member's face, sorry, if a member's face, quote unquote, is threatened, the entire group's honor like, is in danger. Um, we see this, um, this concept of high context culture very prevalent in uh, the Arab, Japanese, Korean, and Chinese cultures as examples. Low context cultures, however, tend to emphasize individualism and independence. Um, there's really no concept of face, um, and everyone is responsible for themselves. Um, we see this sort of low context culture prevalent um, in England, North America, Germany, and Switzerland. So I want you to take a moment, um, and in the chat, if you remember, actually, I'm going to add the true colors in there. Put in your, your true color, if you remember it, um, whether or not you think you are more personally monochronic or polychronic, and if you think you are more high or low context culture. So for example, I might say I am, you know, blue um, and um, polychronic and high context. Thank you, I see a bunch coming in. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna talk really briefly about bias and feedback. So if you've ever written a performance review or received a performance review, um, uh, this, this you're gonna find value, uh, I think, in this. So the first form of bias and feedback comes in vagueness. So this is when feedback is not necessarily tied to any specific work outcomes. Um, so an example of this could be, Tim had a good quarter. We don't know what qualifies as a good quarter. We don't know what Tim did <laughs> to have a good quarter. Um, the next is team-oriented feedback. Uh, so, you know, feedback that is oriented to the team's outcomes, and it's not necessarily clear what the individual did to contribute to that performance. Um, so an example would be Stephanie's team delivered an excellent final report. Maybe true. 
how do we know this? What is the standard by which we are considering something excellent? Um, and what did Stephanie actually do to make that happen? The next is fixed mindset. So during our session on true colors and on reflective leadership, right, and effective communication, we talked about fixed versus growth mindset. Um, so this is feedback that does not necessarily focus on a specific, uh, specific task, but rather um, uh, uh, labels a person instead, right? So saying Marcus is a great designer. We're not talking about Marcus's attention to detail. We're not talking, we're not explicitly stating what necessarily qualifies someone as a great designer. Um, we're simply labeling him as such. Um, so this can, you know, if, if we were to say August is a great public speaker, now, now we are simply labeling someone as either good or bad rather than noting what makes this person a strong public speaker, right? And then lastly, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, but just examples of bias and feedback, feedback that is personality based. Um, so feedback that is focused on one's communication style or personality. Um, so for example, at times, Sarah can be a little abrasive in meetings, right? Um, we, we see this feedback most often given to women when they're told to soften their approach um, and not only just by men, but by other women as well. Um, so, uh, put in the chat, uh, yup, if you have um, experienced receiving feedback that had any of these components of bias in them. So if you've ever had a performance review that was vague or team-oriented or personality-based or was rooted in fixed mindset, just put yup <laughs> in, the, in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Vince. Okay, so um, we'll revisit this again during our next session. But just as a primer, um, here's how you know that kind of the holistically that bias and feedback can show up, right? So Lisa is such a great manager. She was instrumental in the implementation of our new customer service relationship management system, uh, and making sure everyone on the project was well informed and on key dates and decisions. Lisa was also very proactive in her approach to the data engineering system, and suggested improvements to the system and volunteered to take on more than what was originally asked for. However, some people find that Lisa's speaking style and approach can be off-putting at times. While her work is impressive, sometimes her approach to working with others could be softened. Yeah. Now again, today, friends, we are, we are planting a lot of seeds. <laughs> some of it's going to grow, some of it might germinate for a while. Um, but uh, our intention here is to, again, just show us Again, how all of these components contribute to our workplace culture so that hopefully as you see it now, right, when, once, once you see something, you can't unsee it. Um, you'll be looking for these things um, in, in your day-to-day -day practices in your organization and, and also in those who hold power in your organization. All right, let's take a moment to have a little reflection. Uh, what time do we have here? Okay, perfect. So, um, we're gonna break you up into uh, probably groups of two or maybe three, um, three or four. Uh, I want you to discuss with your partner which chronemic culture is most prominent for you in your, oops, sorry, in your family, in your cultural community, and in your workplace. Um, and how have these differences and or similarities impact your lived experience? Okay. Um, do we have... Oh, wait, I don't see. Laura, do we not have breakout room capacity? I may have lied to your friends. Oh, wait, there it is. We do. Yay. Okay. Are there any questions before? Um, and you'll have, uh, let's see, 10 minutes. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment here. You'll have, actually, no, I think we have time for 15 minutes. That way each, if you have three in your group, you'll each have five minutes. Any questions um, before we go into breakout rooms for 15 minutes? Okay, if you have any trouble uh, in your room, just come back to the main room or you can also click on like ask for help. I do see that some folks have called in. Um, yes, I, um, 
we can add the questions into the chat in just a moment. Um, I do see that some folks have called in, so you, you, your, your, your video might not be in your same um, uh, um, room. So if that happens, just uh, chat me, and I, I can move you so that you are together with your voice and your video. <laughs> oh, got it. CPD, got. It. I see your note there. Um, so then, just don't. If you're in CPD, just don't join the group. And then before I do that, let me um, let me chat the question or the prompts into the chat for us. There you go. Okay, and again, we will have fifteen minutes. All right. See you all soon. Welcome, welcome. So I'd like to start first with anyone who was not able to share in a group. Um, what do you feel your chronemic style is? And is it the same or different than the one um, you find yourself being required to adhere to in the workplace? Um, I should say, yeah, let's ask that question first before I ask about family. Looking for a volunteer who would like to share what, your, what you feel your chronemic style is and if that is the same or different from your workplace chronemic. Um, I think my style is probably polychronic, um, but in the workplace, it's absolutely monochronic. Uh, and that's the style that I'm doing my best to work with. Um, but I think it's not too difficult to adapt to monochronic because it's everywhere, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Kiana. Anyone else? I'll go. <laughs> Yeah. I will say that I think uh, I am definitely polychronic for sure. Um, and I think that my workplace, uh, we strive to definitely try to be mono with keeping things on task and making sure we're well scheduled. But we all need to work poly because we do so many things for our position. And there's, you know, a lot of things to be done and a few of us that have to get, you know, have it to get done. But we try our best to lean toward monochronic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is anyone in here, does anyone here on the call do life with someone who has a different chronemic style than you? <laughs> yeah, I see some heads oh, nodding. Yeah. <laughs> Funny <laughs> how, do you, how do you find common ground there? How do you manage potential conflict with that, with the people you do life with who have a different chronemic style than you? Helpful tips for the rest of us. <laughs> I would love to share. I shared this with my group as well. Um, I grew up in a household. My mother could not be more mono and my father could not be more poly. And so um, family trips are not like, there's tension, but not conflict, right? Like it's just not gonna function exactly the same. The perfect example is my father, like hotel lobby, mom needs to plan the day often with me and dad needs to just like chill often with my sister until mom and I feel ready enough that it's time to do our plan and they're just like I'm not a part of that this is fine let's figure it out and my mom and I rely on them to get distracted along the way and find new adventures but like it requires both parties to be patient and understand that this is the way the other has fun <laughs> Love it. I love it. Yeah, I see a lot of comments in the chat about like how much children humble us to so those of us who have children in our lives. Um, I know when I when I have my niece with me, sometimes for weeks at a time, um, even though I, I like to think I'm more poly, um, I am reminded of how much I lean on my mono <laughs> chronemic side and how much that is interrupted <laughs> by my four year old niece and, and, and humbles me in terms of my my perception of what how much control I have over anything but especially time yeah so 
So here's the thing. Yeah, Philipp yes, um, uh, Ana uh, Garcia, yes, the, the Philippine. I always thought it was a Filipino time thing, but because I grew up in the Philippines, as I mentioned before, um, where it was actually considered rude if it to arrive when the invitation stated, right? So for example, if the invitation says, you know, dinner at six, it would be considered rude in the culture I was raised in, in the Philippines, uh, to show up at six, <laughs> because the host wouldn't be ready. You show up at like 6.30, 7, maybe even 7.30. <laughs> Right. Whereas, you know, for my my American friends who are very monochronic dinner, if it says six, you know, 550 at the latest, you show up so that, you know, you can be seated together. And right. If you show up half an hour late, like that's rude. So, yeah, leave some weekends free to practice polychronic and have some mono weekends. Yeah, that's a great idea, Belle. Oh my gosh, so good. So, so right. Now here's the thing, right? We always have to remember because we're taught that like things are either good or bad to remember that both of those approaches to time have value, right? Like if the train is leaving at 10 a.m., it's leaving at 10 a.m. regardless of where we were raised, right? And what our parents were like and all that. Um, so there's value in that. But just knowing what is the task that we're trying to accomplish, right? Are we trying to build community? Are we trying to build trust? Well, might be more beneficial to bring in, you know, the heavy like, artillery for folks who are really versed in polychronic uh, relationship to time, right? They're going to be able to, to help build those relationships and build trust. Are we specifically looking at a deadline here? Are we managing a bunch of interwoven complex projects? Let's bring out our monochronic person, right? A person who's like, maybe they're not the, the, they don't give us the sandwich model, you know, feedback, but we know they're, we might be a little offended, but they're going to get the stuff done, right? It's time to call that person in. So knowing where our, and, it, and here's the other thing too, so many of you have, have alluded to this, that we code switch with this mon this chron uh, chronemicness all the time, right? And so many of us do this almost unconsciously, right? Like how we are how we are with our children, with our parents, right? Our friends might be very different than how we are in our workplaces, right? Or when we're um, engaging with strangers. So love that, love that. Okay, so let's get us back here. Oh, sorry, I lost my, wait, where am I? Boop, boop, boom. Oh. Sorry, friends, wrong file. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Here we go. All right. So um, has anyone, how have you navigated these um, differences in the workplace? Can anyone share an example of when their approach to, to chronemics was maybe originally seen as, as, as not ideal, that it then came um to become a benefit in a certain situation or maybe for yourself or someone else maybe when has when has a problem around oh yeah carrie go right ahead hi thank you um so i was raised uh in a, a monochronic family but lived in the Far East in these um, polychronic cultures. And I, my natural tendency then became the polychronic, I think. Uh, so I um, started working at one point with uh, an engineering company. And I found that I also had to change my language I had to change how I spoke uh, so that I adapted to that culture in order to become successful, which is, I wanted to be successful within that culture. Um, so I learned, yeah, I didn't know, I didn't really know about these terms. Um, and I shared with my group that uh, I didn't use the term code switch, but that's what I do all the time. I do that in groups of women uh, where, we have very high context things and people who particularly men don't can't follow what's going on. Um, and so I feel like I'm code switching basically all the time and I feel comfortable doing that. Um, somebody in our group suggested that it's kind of like a chameleon self was the words that she used and it's a survival mechanism. And I think 
I had not thought of it as a survival mechanism before, but I do see that as um, very true. Mm, thank you so much for that, um, for that, Carrie. So um, I, I just want to share this little graph here for a moment uh, because I feel like it really helps us consider. And again, these are these are presented from binary terms. There's there's a spectrum, right, of communication styles and, and things of that nature. But I think this helps us kind of see the the polarity of of how we are socialized to engage with one another and how we're socialized to perceive things as either correct or incorrect or effective or ineffective. When in reality, it's all very subjective to you know the the situation at hand, right? Um, and the 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 community members and individuals and players like at hand. Um, so we have, you know, communication, concepts of time, we have, we have collectivism versus individualism, trust building, uh, we have universalism versus particularism, um, leadership, right, egalitarian versus hierarchical. Um, they all, they all have a place. Um, but the key, what I want you to take away from this, um, this segment of the, the presentation is awareness that um, the, the best approach is going to be dependent on your goal and your circumstance and also what is what is authentic and organic to you and to the person you are attempting to um, to build with to to accomplish something with. Okay, some considerations around class migration. Uh, covering is is one tactic. Uh, this is where well we'll talk about these in a moment, but uh, the other is stereotype threat, uh, and then racial battle fatigue. So uh, covering uh, all of these things, covering stereotype threat, racial battle fatigue are all components that lead to cognitive overload. Right, it's us using our brains um, extensively um, in a, for an, a matter that's really about uh, to Carrie's point. It's about survival. And it interrupts our ability to use our cognitive abilities to actually do the task we are trying to do. <laughs> um, so essentially it creates more work <laughs> for us. Um, so when we are you know, thinking about cultivating what culture is necessary for all to thrive, we wanna be thinking about who is burdened with the cognitive overload in these spaces, right? Um, so sorry, let me go back. So covering is, for example, if someone is you know, making jokes about a social faux pas, which is something that for for individuals of um, a, a higher socioeconomic status, that is that tends to be the humor, right? It's about social faux pas. Um, whereas for more, maybe more middle class individuals, um, the the humor is based on uh, intellectualism, um, and then for individuals of a uh, of the working class of generational elite poverty, the humor tends to be based on more like slapstick, right, type of humor. Again, these are generalizations, but based on studies, this tends to be like the the common um, concept. Uh, another way to think about this is around food. Right, food is very personal. Um, for, for communities that where resources are very sparse, the priority is around, um, did you get enough to eat? For middle-class um, individuals, the, the focus on food is quality, right? Is it, is it high quality food? Is it organic? Is it, you know? Um, and then for generationally wealthy, the the food value is on um, elitism, on on um, rarity, right? Like, oh, I'm eating this caviar, or I'm, um, you know, I, this is a rare quail egg from the Isles of whatever, right? It's very much so about like um, how special this thing is. It's not really about quality or or quantity. It's about rarity. I hope that makes sense. Um, and so covering is when people are alluding to judgment based on social class, a person who is of that particular social class who has maybe um, experienced now a higher social class because of migration, right? C class migration, either they've achieved higher social class through education, through a new job, through marriage, um, you know, moving to another country, right? As an example, my younger brother, 
when we moved to the Philippines, he used to say to, to me and my, my mother, like, you know, in America, we're poor, but in the Philippines, we're wealthy. <laughs> But because, you know, the logic of a child, he's like, wait, we, we have a driver and we have a this and a that. And, you know, and back home, that's not how we live. <laughs> right. So so it's just again, class class migration can be a very interesting uh, uh, thing. Um, stereotype threat. Right. So, for example, for, for myself as a black woman, if I'm talking about social inequities to a group of middle aged white men, I might be super conscientious of of the fear of being perceived as an angry black woman. And so I might be going into the workshop thinking about cracking jokes and making sure my cadence is um, perky and, and, you know, and not too like low or high or high pitched, right? Um, so much so that I am just spinning my wheels and working overtime to make sure I am overcompensating for stereotype threat, that it might actually harm my ability to do the job that I was hired to do. We see this oftentimes happening for women um, who are, you know, maybe one of the only people in um, a working environment. We also see it with men who are working in places Places that are maybe predominantly female, right? Like maybe working as a nurse or a teacher. So um, uh, the same thing for, you know, when it comes to sexual orientation, right? And feeling like people are, which is not, you know, something that is, is always visible. Uh, and so navigating stereotype threats in that regard, um, like being a mechanic um, and, and being a gay man. Uh, racial battle fatigue, right? For individuals of color, especially who are functioning in historically white spaces, that's, a, again, racial battle fatigue is a whole other <laughs> workshop, but it's just something to keep in mind that these are components to cognitive overload um, that based on identity, you know, uh, one last example I'll give is for folks who have a disability, right, who might not be, um, where that disability might not be visible, having to constantly ask, like, you know, this is, today's a great example, can we get closed captioning, right, or having to constantly ask for accommodations that really should be available to all um, can produce a form of battle, like cognitive battle fatigue as well. Okay, why does this matter? Well, it matters because it affects our relationships with um, uh, with other people. It affects how we communicate and how others communicate with us. Uh, our identity also informs our own self-concept, uh, our confidence, and our perception of ability to take on certain responsibilities, roles, or career goals. And the awareness and or lack thereof can contribute to a sense of belonging or exclusion due to one's comfort, right, um, with others and with our familiarity with, uh, within different professional and social settings. A sense of exclusion from one's family uh, or class of origin can also occur um, if one has experienced a change in social class, again, as I mentioned earlier, through education, employment, or life partnerships. And then lastly, our uh, social class influences our perceptions and decisions around money, power, status, organizational structure, policies, and even just general management hierarchy systems. So what do we do about this? Well, what I recommend we do in terms of inter uh, in, in injecting intersectionality into our Jedi work um, is a cyclical process of identifying your hidden rules. Make sure that opportunities are accessible to all. So constantly combing your practices, like how long are you leaving out deadlines? What is the process to apply for a job or a volunteer opportunity? Are you, are you placing value on things such as, oh, this person has two seasons of volunteer work, therefore they're more dedicated, right? That, that kind of mindset, rather than asking oneself, who has the opportunity to volunteer, right? For, for a position that they might be passionate about. Um, minding meritocracy, this notion that those who work the hardest and who have the best ideas tend to win, um, that's a complete fallacy, <laughs> right? Uh, so really being mindful of this notion that those in power are there simply because they truly were the best. Really questioning, again, not to take away from the accomplishments of those um, uh, who are successful, but really being honest about um, systems of oppression. I'll, I'll give you a really vulnerable example. While I am a Black woman, um, I have no doubt that being a petite, 
uh, lighter skinned black woman absolutely um, helps my ability to be successful in my role. And I'll tell you why because I have lost track of how many times uh, fuller figured, older, darker skinned black women have said the exact same thing I am saying to all of you today and then many other courses. And they have either been dismissed, um, they have been met with um, hostility. Um, uh, audience members have you know, proclaimed that, oh, I just, I can't understand what she's saying or what they're saying. And then I say the exact same thing and they're like, oh, that makes sense. And I'm like, I, I said nothing different than what this person just said. So, so being really honest about that and acknowledging where privilege lies, again, not to discredit, you know, I know I'm personally a hard worker, but not to discredit it, but to really be honest about where various systems are offering us privilege and when they're offering us oppression so that we can actually work to eliminate them. Measure efforts and success, right? What gets measured gets improved. How we measure, what we measure is where equity comes into play. Being mindful that we're not simply measuring quantity, right? That we are measuring from a holistic standpoint, measuring against um, uh, uh, experiences, evaluating cultures intersectionally to see if there's any disparities in experiences based around identity, um, which again, assessing your employee or participant experiences intersectionally. Are parents able to be active board members as much as your single um, uh, and, and non-child um, uh, having uh, board members? And then influencing the industry, right? Uh, I think a lot of us, especially smaller nonprofits, smaller environmental organizations, underestimate the power that they have to drive culture for our whole industry. But the thing is, um, I'll give you one example of what I do in my own company. We have what's called an interview guide that we share with um, uh, crew leaders who are applying. Do I think our interview guide is perfect? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, but what it does do is it, it informs the person who's considering employment with us whether or not um, they want to work for a company like ours. They know how long the interview will be, who will be interviewing them, what the interview questions are even going to be, what culture will be like if they are hired on so that they know what's the day in the life of. They get that all in one packet in advance because it's important that they are evaluating us as potential employers as much as we are evaluating them as potential employees. And the value too, as an example of sharing questions in advance, which I'll talk about in our next workshop, um, is that it's not only something that's beneficial to individuals who might, uh, who, who where English might be their second language, right? And it might be beneficial for them to be able to read the questions in advance, but it also is helpful for folks who might have generalized anxiety disorders, who, might, who, who people who need to plan uh, for childcare while they're inter, you know, or, or um, uh, parental care if they're caregiving for a parent or a sibling. Um, the other thing is too, unless you are hiring for a position that is in charge of um, you know, trauma communication, <laughs> um, we're not really evaluating people for how effective they are at answering questions on the fly, right? So, so what we really want to know is what do they actually truly think? What is their actual true approach? And so offering questions for your interview in advance does everyone a favor, um, right? Because someone who has test anxiety is probably not going to be able to be successful um, in an interview process, right? That is very high stress, especially if that's not an accurate replication of what their day-to-day -day life will be like in your organization, right? Even if every one of us at least has a few hours to respond to an email, right? Because we're not expected to constantly be on the fly. So yeah, influence the industry. Um, and then connect with talent early. We should not be building relationships with communities uh, because we have a board seat open or a job posting, right? We should be constantly thinking about how are we connecting with individuals, with communities? How are we promoting awareness of what we're doing? right? Um, so that we're not simply becoming, you know, what I like to call the Uncle Jim that only shows up when he wants to borrow $20. <laughs> okay. So this is what I'd like to leave you all with. Thinking about your organizations, what, and I'd love for you to, to host this, this reflection with your organizations. What are the hidden rules in your organization? Right? What are the hidden norms that people just know, but no one ever, it's not written down anywhere? Um, uh, are they equitable? 
Uh, and if yes, how do you communicate these hidden norms, uh, these hidden rules to newcomers? And if they're not equitable, how can you replace them? How can you eliminate them? Okay. And with that, friends, that's all I have for you today. August, could you go back to the previous slide, slide please? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. I wanted to everyone let everyone know that the uh, workshop was recorded and will be on our website for one month after today. Also, um, we will include a PDF of these slides. So if there's any that you want to see further, and someone earlier had asked about some of the graphics, they will also be listed on our website. So they'll be available there. And hi, everybody. This is um, Mark Bowman at the Field Museum. And maybe you saw Laura Milkert's chat, um, which is that uh, next on the 27th, we're honoring August as the um, recipient of our Parker Gentry Award. And we'd like to invite you all to consider coming to that virtual uh, celebration of August's amazing work. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you so much to the Fute Museum. <laughs> We're Creep City Conservation and I are really proud to be the first urban conservation program to receive that honor. So well, all right, everyone. I will let you have the rest of your day. Um, as always, if there are any, uh, I'll also make sure that you have access to any of the resources that I've just casually mentioned, like that interview guide. Um, I'll make sure that you all get access to those templates as well in case they could be of use um, to all of you. But thank again, you, thank Anna. you so much for being here today, friends, and I'll see you next month. If not on the 27th, 